Okay, so in part two of the uh, material this week, I'm going to talk about some sociological themes and uh, go into more of the nitty-gritty of some of the conceptual uh, things that sociology wants us to look at, um, and some of the traditions of sociology as well. So I mentioned in the first lecture, the first video, that um, you know the traditions of sociology draw upon criticism, research, and theory. So, um, you know, doing research on on you know society in general, on the way that individuals function in society, the way the institutions work, inequalities, power, gender relations, race relations, all these things, um, was really important for the production of knowledge about our, our world, about how, how we live, and the way that we relate to each other. So this is important in and of itself, you know, just like philosophy about, you know, um, humans and the way that they live is important. But in terms of doing research on this stuff, it's really important in terms of formulating good policy. Now, whether or not, you know, the way that um, our sociological researchers listen to in terms of good policy is somewhat debatable, um, but still certainly that's one of the key motivations of having that kind of knowledge of the world. This research tends to um, endeavour um, us to think about the world critically. And again, this is important from policy situation and policy formulations, not just because, you know, we want to be critical of things, but to have a critical mindset towards something should also involve a way of thinking about making things better. So criticism and research are really um, combined there in terms of, you know, here's a social problem, Let's go and find about what it is, what's going on, and then how can we contribute to, to maybe uh, making things better. So raw research is you know, really important, new knowledge of society, understanding the world, but it's also important sometimes to put that to good use and try and um, make whatever the social problem is better. In terms of the theories and concepts that you will be looking at in, this, in the um, course, uh, Mitchell will go into that in much more detail next week. Um, but it's important to have, you know, broader conceptual understandings of the way the world, wor world works, particularly, you know, in a rapidly changing world. So theories are a way of kind of, you know, thinking about the general in the particular and the particular in the general, um, thinking about the way systems um, enact and um, how they relate to the way that we live and, and um, play and, and work. So I won't go into too much theory stuff at the moment because we'll do a whole uh, week on the foundations of that next week um, and I'll talk more about various sociological concepts um, um, in this week. So conceptually a key relation is the individual and society and that's one of the kind of tensions and relations that we want to look at in this course and what sociology does. It's important before I kind of talk about this that, that like structure and agency is kind of two separate things is a little bit of an oversimplification. Um, really you know uh, most social theories kind of have moved beyond this kind of very broad dichotomy, but it's a good way to kind of introduce a way of thinking about the world and to think about those relations. So structures, in terms of the way we're going to talk about them in this course, very broadly um, relate to the cultural and social institutions, inequalities and norms that constrain what we can and can do and who we can be, but also those structures, it's important to remember, provide us with freedoms and ways of living and, and ways of functioning as well. So structures aren't always restraints. Structures can also um, be like in some ways helpful or um, provide opportunities and things like that. The kind of, you know, an example of that is, you know, a structure is the law. You know, law provides various you know, things that we uh, can and can't do in, in society. And if you break those laws, you know, you're open to sanction. But really, you know, the, the structure of the law that says that we can't kill other people really isn't all that much of a constraint in many ways. It actually guarantees the freedom for many of us. So in that sense, the structure is working, you know, for our freedom or, you know, for our autonomy in many ways because we don't have to worry as much about people coming to kill us as we may if, if it was illegal. Um, so that's kind of one way of thinking about structures. Not always restraining, not always... Um, you know, powerful, oppressing things, they also um, open things up as well. Critically, though, sociologists tend to engage with institutions and norms and inequalities as structures um, and criticise them and, and think about ways that we can kind of uh, make things better. So we have structures on the one hand, agency on the other. Agency is the concept of basically how much as an individual are you free to act in the world? 
how much can you put your choices into practice? And so you can see that the relationship between structure and agency fundamentally kind of critically engages with the very idea of choice. Um, we all kind of feel like we make our own decisions and how we practice in our lives, agency, but we're not completely free to make those decisions, you know, outside of social constraints and influences, the structures. So this is a kind of tension that sociologists are particularly interested in. I mean, an example would be you're all kind of, you know, maybe at least sitting watching this video or listening to it or whatever, you know, how free is that choice? Really, if you could be doing anything else, you know, you may be doing that, right? So, you know, but you're not because you want to, you know, come to university, get a degree, get a better job. Your choice, your agency there is constrained by wider, you know, structural considerations about, you know, getting a good job, um, you know, having money to do the things that you want to do, um, become an attractive partner for someone or whatever. So these are the kind of broader tensions that we're looking at. So the structure and age debate, um, as far as it goes, is thinking about how free we are to act. As I said, we all like to think we're kind of making entirely independent choices about our lives, but we're not free from these choices. And I suppose you can feel, you know, how you're not free sometimes of maybe how your parents would put pressure on you. You know, the family in that sense is a structure around the ways that you can and can't, you know, do the things that you want to do. More broadly, the way that we think about this is kind of, you know, the freedom of opportunity for people to do things, you know. So even if you've, you know, done really well at school, you're not just free to go to Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard to go to university. Um, unless you can get some kind of scholarship, you probably need to have, you know, quite a lot of money or high status parents or people with connections, even if you kind of got the entrance marks to get into those kind of things. So again, that's a really good example. Education systems are, in a way, in terms of that structure before, um, in some respects set up to kind of make us better, make us kind of more knowledgeable, make us understand a particular, you know, discipline that allows us to get a job. But within that kind of broad structure that affords us various things, there's a whole bunch of inequalities. You know, from my own point of view, in terms of status across the world, my University of Newcastle PhD does not have higher status as an Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard. There's, you know, structural constraints based around that kind of educational um, choices that I made. So on the one end, we have this idea of voluntarism. Some people argue that we can do whatever we want at any time. On the other end, we have this kind of structural determinism that, you know, where we're born into the world completely, um, almost fatalistically decides, you know, what we can and can't do. Most sociologists are somewhere in the middle around that, you know, and talk about how this kind of um, agency and structure kind of intertwine in various ways, and it's not necessarily one or the other. So broadly, the way that we practice in the world, the way that we kind of make choices, the way we get up in the morning and go about our day-to-day -day lives, um, we're operating kind of within and through these social structures. So we're strongly influenced by our social environments, but they don't completely determine us. We're shaped by, determine us, we're shaped by social structures. You know, we have it, we inhabit them, but we also create them and reproduce them and in some respects can have some opportunities or have some influence on hopefully reinventing them. So while there are aspects of sociology that are quite deterministic and kind of see us as puppet on strings, um, others see us more kind of um, more complex than that, that we have some autonomy, some agency to kind of put our own choices into place. And so throughout the rest of the course, we'll be presenting you a whole different array of different conceptual ideas to think about that tension. And you'll see there's kind of a almost a trajectory of, um, you know, some lean more toward structures, some lean more towards agency, um, but all are trying to understand how power works, how we can put our choices into practice and how um, free we are to, you know, make the world in our own image. Okay, so I'm going to move on to talk about four key sociological themes. We'll do specific weeks on these later in the course, but they're also, I think, Good to introduce now to think um, uh, in the background um, and to understand the first couple of weeks of the course as well. So the first one is class, um, and you'll hear a little bit more about that in week two um, around the work of Marx and Durkheim, and I'll do a whole, a whole week of it um, in, I think, you know, week eight or something as well, um, where we think about how our economic position, 
affects our opportunities and life chances. Essentially, a lot of sociology shows if you've got more money, if you live in a kind of more upwardly mobile um, suburb, if you've got more higher qualified parents who know the right people, you're going to have a lot more opportunities than those that don't. So class is one way of thinking about um, advantage and disadvantage, um, privilege and inequality, um, and how one's economic position uh, fundamentally affects the different opportunities that we have in life. And I'm you know, using the examples of Harvard and Cambridge and what before, you know, the schools you attend in Australia, there's a real private and public divide um, that has effects on that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, these kind of material things are really important to think about class. We'll go into a lot more detail later in the course. We'll also look at cultural and symbolic aspects of class as well, around things like status, you know, you know, the white blue collar divide, why kind of apparently jobs where you use your mind seen as kind of better and more higher status than if you use your body. Um, how occupations, therefore, uh, are really um, key ways of thinking about how class inequalities work. Some occupations, for instance, kind of get to define what's legal, what's tasteful, what's moral. Um, and these often mean that those people who get to decide that get to decide that their own morals and tastes and things that they think are, should be legal or not are, and others don't get that kind of say. So there's a kind of power relationship there in terms of cultures and institutions about who gets to define those things. So you can see class from a kind of economic perspective, but we can also we'll be looking at class from um, a more kind of cultural perspective as well, and how these kind of our you know class background affects our orientation towards things like values and opinions and tastes. So the the gift there kind of <laughs> I think is a really uh, pithy way of thinking about class. You know the ruling class, the middle class, and the working or disadvantage there, explain with cookies. Um, and more so class is a real way of thinking about capitalism that we'll look at in quite some detail next week, um, about like the way society is set up, it seems to kind of advantage some people over the others. And here you hear, hear terms like the 1% and you know the billionaire class and all that kind of stuff. So um, class in that sense is a key way of thinking systematically about inequality. Second key sociological theme is gender, um, and this is particularly prominent at the moment, I would argue, in kind of our politics, um, you know, around the likes of Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins, and they're like what I think has really um, been important influence in Australia over the past year or so, and the controversies that seem to surround them, I think, speak to a lot of the gender um, concepts that we'll be looking at throughout the course. In some ways, you know, the, the rise of those kind of uh, people are good examples of the way societies can change, or hopefully can change. So again, in terms of the sociological questions that we'll be looking at here, you know, we were looking at kind of the whole the nature-nurture debate, you know, biology and culture, how much of our kind of ways that we think about ourselves and position ourselves as male or female, masculine and feminine, that kind of thing, relates to our biology and how much is a socially... Um, socialised and socially constructed. Um, and, you know, sociology shows that, you know, the actual kind of nature side, you know, has quite a few effects, but, like, really there's so much different ways in society that we socialise through these things, gender, you know, blue and pink and Tonka trucks and Barbie dolls and all this kind of stuff that seems to almost enforce gender roles from an early age. So we look at socialisation around gender, We'll look at more structural constraints around the way that women are paid less, the way women, even you know, with full-time work, are still doing more of the housework and looking after kids, and things like how casualisation and precarity in the labour market affects women much more than it does men. Linked to gender, and uh, but certainly not the same thing as sexualities, um, and we'll look at this in some detail in the course as well. Um, and think about uh, you know how there's kind of almost a hierarchy of things that are deemed more normal, normal and deviant when it comes to sexualities and how these things have changed over time, but how these also still result in a whole range of discriminations. And again, particularly pre prevalent um, around um, the last couple of years around um, gay marriage debates and more recently about the discrimination of um, trans people um, in the debate around the religious discrimination bill. 
Um, more culturally, we can kind of think about how gender plays out um, in culture, like you know, the rise in the 80s in particular of things like anore anorexia in the 90s around metrosexuality and the way these things um, around, say, the body and the way things around different kind of forms of consumption are linked to gender relations. And the um, photos there kind of point some of that stuff out, you know, the different kind of labels we give to women based on the length of their dress, the way is that kind of women are policed and treated much more differently in sporting um, realms than men are. Um, the, the way that um, popular culture is largely dominated by men speaking, particularly in things like films and television. And the cartoon there, you know, about the, you know, the different offence that uh, men seem to take around um, women's issues. <laughs> I think that, um, that uh, cartoon in particular is really good at expressing that. The third thing we'll be looking at is race and ethnicity. Again, this is a similar uh, way that kind of class and gender are seen as contours inequality. This um, race and ethnicity is one as well. We'll be looking at specific issues and definitions around what race and ethnicity are. It's increasingly, increasingly questionable whether race really scientifically exists as a category in terms of things like genes and stuff like that. Um, it seems that as much that there's differences, um, gene differences within so-called races and between them. So, um, but certainly regardless of that, you know, racism still is a very huge problem and divide in our society. So we were looking the way that racism itself has changed over time from scientific to more cultural racism. We're looking at things around like discriminations um, and the way that people are kind of pulled and pushed around the world in terms of migrants and refugees. You can think culturally in Australia about our indigenous population and their treatment in terms of things like the white Australian policy um, and the stolen generations that Kath Butler will be looking at in some detail in the course. Um, you know, the rise of Islamophobia particularly in the post-September 11 world, um, even things like, you know, very much questioning the common sense idea of what it means to be Australian that seems to mean very different things to different people. And this certainly relates to um, globalisation that we'll do a whole week on um, and how these kind of ways that um, for the first, well, well, not for the first time, but like uh, more than ever, you know, in terms of uh, the way countries um, rely on upon each other, the way that we're exposed to other cultures, what all this means in terms of the way that we relate to each other. And there's even like, um, I, I, we'll look a little bit at kind of um, the notion of hipster racism, the different ways that cultural appropriation, um, and as the example down there is the use of um, the headwear like as a fashion item that kind of completely um, appropriates really important cultural signifiers. The, the, the two other things on the page there I think are uh, are really interesting ways of thinking about framing and the way that race and ethnicity um, in, in terms of making the normal look strange is really prominent but kind of subtly um, expressed in the way things are framed in our media. Sometimes subtly, sometimes not so much. So the, the, the Katrina um, disaster that happened with the hurricane in 2005 in Florida, you can see almost identical pictures there but the way that they're reported is very different. African-American who's, you know, found some supplies in the flood water is looting. The two white people are finding stuff. Um, very subtle differences really in the way they're reporting, but these are kind of, you know, death by a thousand cuts in many ways in terms of the way this is just completely normal in the way things are framed in our media. The cartoon down the bottom does a very similar thing. The brown person, you know, that, that kills people with a gun is a terrorist. The, you know, the black African-American person is seen as a thug. But if it's a white person that competes a mass shooting, there's a whole bunch of more complexities apparently around this kind of thing. So, again, the framing of these things, the way that different people are treated differently, um, even though they've committed the same act or very similar acts, um, as will be looked at and we'll have some conceptual ways of thinking about that later in the course. The last key sociological theme I want to talk about is power. Um, and now power is something that we we'll basically be considering every week. Um, we're not doing a whole week on it, but it is in all the weeks, um, really. So, you know, thinking about power, who has it and who doesn't? Is power actually something you can possess? Um, when is it legitimate to use power? Um, who does it benefit? Um, there's different conceptual ways of thinking about power. They're not necessarily, you know, one's more right than others in many ways. A lot of the different conceptual ways of thinking about power can get us just to kind of have an understanding of the different contextual ways that it's used. 
So sometimes power is top down, sometimes it just kind of feels like it's everywhere, um, or it's more subtle in the sense that like it's set up in the architecture of social space. Normally I would give this example in a lecture theatre, so like I'd be standing at the front and there'd be like a lectern in front of me that kind of designates me as the speaker and the expert. All the students are in the uncomfortable chairs in the massive lecture theatre. Um, it's the institution and the architecture of social space in that that kind of gives me in some sense more power and status than you as the student. But if I was to meet you outside of the university context, outside of that lecture theatre, I don't know, in a pub, on the sporting field, in the street, really that kind of power relationship disappears. So um, in that sense, um, you know, we have to think about the different kind of relations and when it applies and when it doesn't. So questions here, do individuals have power? Do groups have power? Does money equal power? Does knowledge equal power? Does being a white male equal power? Increasingly today, you know, how much do power do algorithms have and companies like social media that we'll look at in some detail throughout the course as well. So power, what it means, how it works, and how it affects relations, life chances, is a key thing we'll be looking at. So I just thought I'd finish this section on a kind of everyday example to kind of make the normal look strange that comes out of my own work. There's a, a link there to um, a podcast kind of radio show that I did around this, and this is the idea of hipsters and bogans, and kind of this speaks to class, but it also speaks to gender and race and power. And we think about this kind of between self-identity and social identity. The hipster often kind of talks about, is related to middle class kind of, specific consumer taste. The bogan tends to be used as an insult um, to those below them in the um, status system, you know, VB drinkers and Commodore drivers or whatever. Uh, in my work, what I find interesting is the way that these things are written about and reported upon, or the way that, say, comedy is um, made using these different figures, um, really much reflects who's making them. Um, our journalists, people, our filmmakers, comedians tend to be quite middle class. And they tend to therefore reflect their orientation towards these things, that is their class relation to them, in the things that they produce. And that, what this seems to mean is that like the hipster tended to be reported as a much more playful icon. It's kind of problematic in a way that, you know, irony and kind of obsessions with, you know, organic beer or um, single origin coffee or whatever. It's kind of seen as kind of silly in many ways, but, um, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, hipsters are silly, but like they're okay. Bogans seem to be reported much more as being, you know, a cultural problem, you know, wasteful, violent, or whatever. But what, what I would say about that is that reporters tend to be more middle class. Their tastes and values seem to orient themselves more towards kind of agreeing with hipster tastes. And that relates then to the way that these things are written about or the way that pop culture uses those figures. So in terms of self-identity and social identity... Self-identity is the way you think about yourself. Social identity is kind of the way that you categorise and think about others. The hipster and the bogan mean different things, depending on, you know, what your own social situation is. In many instances, one person's hipster is, is another's bogan. So, um, again, this is just an everyday example that um, we can think about to um, think about the way that kind of, as a photo down there with the women, expresses a diff one form of gender, but the more hipster one above it. Um, there's a class distinction going on with the way that gender is enacted there. Um, you'd see the similar thing with beards over there. You know, the more curated beard represents the more middle class, tasteful. You know, the more messy you know, beers and high beers represents the more kind of working class point of view. If you're interested in that work, um, I've written about it extensively in the book Youth, Class and Everyday Life. And there's a bunch of kind of media stuff that you'll be able to link to in the links at the end of the third lecture if you uh, want to look at that in more detail. Okay, I'm going to stop there for this one and come back and talk about the sociological imagination in the third video.